This was 2.30 a.m. this morning. This is the future state of the motion picture industry. Fifty fifty by 2020 to get women to get the bigger budgets as well. It's very important that we put the stories in the hands of the people who own those stories. Good afternoon, welcome. There's no better place to be on a three o'clock on a Tuesday than right here where you are. So welcome. My name is Karina Rotenstein. I'm the TIFF Industry Conference producer and welcome to our last day at the conference, day five. I hope you've been enjoying the programming so far. We still have one more session, two more sessions to go. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. Just a few housekeeping notes, just a reminder, no professional uh, video or photography allowed in the studio, but not to worry, we are live streaming and recording for TIFF, so we're taking care of that for you. All of our talks will be on uh, the TIFF Talks channel on YouTube, and if you do uh, check out all these things and also are engaging in our socials, please use the hashtag TIFF19. So we are incredibly honored to welcome Tom Perota for a masterclass this afternoon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Academy Award nominated screenwriter, TV producer, and best-selling novelist whose titles, of course, you know, Election, Little Children, The Abstinence Teacher, and The Leftovers, that's just some of his titles. And his work moves and bends from page to screen, exploration of sex, school, suburbia, and contemporary marriage combined with eccentric and profoundly human characters lead to stories which captivate avid literary film and TV audiences worldwide. Tom Perota joins us here at TIFF to premiere Mrs. Fletcher, his new HBO series based on his novel starring the wonderful Katherine Hahn, and which is part of TIFF's primetime program. The show premieres tonight at 9.30 p.m. at the TIFF Bell Lightbox. He's carved out an extraordinary career, and so that's why we've invited him today, and we're so excited. Hosting today's masterclass is Michael Lerman. He is the programmer for the Special Presentations Program and the U.S. here at TIFF. He's the artistic director of the Philadelphia Film Society, co-founded the Overlook Film Festival, and has produced and written project for projects such as Natural Causes and Man from Reno, which, for which he was nominated for an Independent uh, Spirit Award. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Lerman and Tom Perota. Welcome, Tom. Oh, thank you. We're so happy to have you here. No, I'm very happy to be um, here. I, I'm going to start simply and ask, you know, as a storyteller, can you remember the first story that really impacted you, that you were told in your life? Wow. Maybe that wasn't so simple. Yeah. But, um, I, you know, I feel like stories have just been there mm -hmm. forever. I mean, I mean. I do remember, um, so my father grew up in a family of, uh, he was one of seven Italian brothers. And these guys were working class, mostly very silent men. And, but every now and then when they'd get together, they would start telling stories, often about their mother, who was this tiny, apparently very tyrannical woman. Yeah. And they would, just, they would just go on and on about how tough she was and how, like, if you spoke to her in a way that she didn't like, she would grab you by the ear and pull it. You know, it was actually stories of real cruelty from their mother. You know, was, I don't think she was a super tender woman, but they would laugh and laugh, you know, and there, there was something about laughing about how tough their mother was that made them seem like brothers and seem very human and available to me in a way that... Right. Um, it, I don't know, it made them knowable. Like these, these stories created a family in a sense that um, 
when, when in other ways they were a little bit um, remote and unavailable. So, I, you know, I, I was always struck by the way in which um, my family seemed most like a family when they were telling stories that only the family knew. Right. Do you feel like that, in, that kind of experience informs your work? It's interesting because you mentioned many things that to me speak to touchstones in your work, family, um, the working class, um, the tension between that kind of tyrannical or, or, or vicious or, you know, I don't want to say evil of your grandmother, but, but that, that kind of nature versus... <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a good cook. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, um, <laughs> Italian family. Well, I, I, think, I think maybe that sense that um, if you could tell a story in such a way that it produced a feeling of connection with somebody else and made them laugh, right. that in some way it would redeem whatever in it that was hard or, or demoralizing. Like, like, I do think that is um, something that I hold on to. I do think um, even dark stories can create some sense of connection and shared humanity that um, does have a redemptive quality. Right. Had, has it always interest you, do you always start with character in that way? When you, when you kind of look at it? Um, I, I don't actually, which, which is um, surprising because I think of myself as a writer of characters. Right. But I, everything starts with an idea or, or a situation or, you know, theme broadly speaking. Um, so I would say if I was writing election, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking of Tracy Flick. I was right. thinking of, of the process of an election. And, and um, when I was writing The Wishbones, I wasn't thinking of Dave. I was thinking of a wedding band. You know, abstinence teacher, I was thinking about um, the debate around sex education. Um, so I, I, I do start, oddly, um, from abstract or thematic concerns, and then the characters grow in the course of the writing. Naturally from those. Yeah. How much do you feel like you pull from your life today in like day-to-day -day life? I think I'm less autobiographical than a lot of novelists that I know. Um, but I can tell you what the autobiographical element is in everything I write, because there always is, and probably in every character I write. And I think, you know, to the extent that um, you can look at my work as a whole and see that there are certain obsessions and certain subjects right. I return to again and again, I would say that's the kind of subterranean autobiography. Right. I, I, I guess I was, I was referring more to like, you know, is there somebody that, rem that you feel like you saw Tracy Flick somewhere or something like that? Oh, well, in that case, um, I was, this really is autobiographical. I went from a kind of very traditional working class Catholic world uh, to Yale yeah. in uh, you know, late 70s or early 80s. And, met all sorts of people that I hadn't met before, including um, a, a bunch of really ambitious, talented women mm -hmm. um, who, had, who seemed just very different to me from the women I had, the girls I had grown up with. And then I went to graduate school and I came back and started teaching at Yale and Harvard as well. And, and I was just so aware that like this new generation of incredibly talented, powerful, and ambitious women had, had arrived and was so aware of, I mean, they seemed very novel to me because I hadn't grown up in a world that, that produced a lot of them. Um, so it was more like Tracy was me reacting. It was only, she's like a composite of maybe like the most ambitious women that I knew in, in the Ivy League. Right, that makes sense. Um, when you speak about a, of fixations and kind of, certain themes you come back to, certain things you come back to. The one that always stands out to me is suburbia. And I, 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 guess, I, I guess what I want to ask is, what is your fixation with suburbia? What, is, what interests you as much as it does about it? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. this is, uh, so when Little Children came out, um, 
I went on the radio show Fresh Air for the first time, and it was like a huge uh, landmark for me, you know, because I would listen to that show, and so many of my heroes had been on it, and I felt like, oh, I've really arrived, you know, I'm on Fresh Air, and I, I spent days preparing for it, you know, I said, oh, if she asked this question, this is what I'll say, and, and had all kinds of talking points, and I said, it was much like this interview today, mm -hmm. I sit down, and uh, she's a voice on the phone, we weren't in the same room, and she said, Tom, what is it about suburbia? And, and I realized I had never thought that I was writing about suburbia. Um, I was always writing about, like with little children, I was writing about sexual transgression. Right. Um, but the, my imagination, it just goes to a suburban context. That's where I grew up, that's where I, live now, and the sort of stories I tell happen in a suburban context, but it was, I never thought I was investigating that context. It just seemed the backdrop to the real, the real thing. Um, but it's true that I, my imagination doesn't seem to function in other contexts. That's interesting, it's, it's almost like that's the autobiographical piece. It's, it's your imagination is living where you're living even if it's living with a different idea. Yeah, and that's, that's, it's the world I know. And I remember even as a teenager, one time just sort of, I was, I was uh, getting high, I recall, and <laughs> looking at my Where friends. All the best ideas come yeah, from. I was looking at my friends and I just think like, I'm gonna tell their story, yeah. you know? And it was like a very empowering uh, moment of being high. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you have told their story somewhere along the line? Yeah, you know, and one of the things I think now is that um, I'm so lucky that I grew up before social media. Yeah. Because I, I went away to college and grad school, and that world almost like ceased to exist for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I just I wasn't in touch with it anymore, and I really felt like it existed only in my imagination, and that it was my story to tell, and. And people, when Bad Haircut, my first book, came out that was very much about that world, people were really excited by it to see, like, oh, I remember that thing that happened, or I remember that person. Um, but now there's just, like, you know, Facebook groups that dedicate themselves to, like, remembering that world. Right. That, um, and I just think if that had existed then, I would never have felt this sense of artistic ownership of it. It's almost like holding it in your imagination, making it your own... It's a way to still be there. Yeah, I just felt like, oh, that world would be gone if I didn't right. tell it. But of course, it existed in all these other people's memories. Right. But they didn't have a public way to share those memories, and now they do. Right. So when you're, when you're writing, when you get the kernel of an idea from somewhere, and you start to develop the characters from it, is there, do you have a process? Are you, are you outlining? Are you just writing pages and then seeing who comes out of them, that sort of thing? Where, what's, what's kind of the yeah. typical path. Right, I'm, I'm never outlining. Yeah. Um, I'm never, it just doesn't seem possible to me to know where the story goes if I don't know who the characters right. are. And so um, what I'm often doing is um, I always write in order too. I, I, you know, it's not like, oh, I have some chunk that is over here and I'll write it now. And then right, I'll go back. Right. I start with chapter one and when I have a chapter one that feels like the real thing to me, then I'll write chapter two. And at each time I'll think, if I'm reading this book, what do I want to know? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't always give the reader that, but I'm aware if I'm withholding it. I mean, yeah. I, I understand the value of withholding it and um, making people look over here when they want to look over there, like that's a big part of it. But I am often asking myself, what, what does the reader want to know right now? Mm -hmm. How much of that process is then going back and tweaking? Like, I, I have figured out what my resolution is going to be. I need to plant the seed of it here, or I need to mention this detail here. Less than, than you would think. Yeah. Um, and I almost feel like um, you could actually, I, I can see where certain ideas appear. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for instance, in the show, Mrs. Fletcher, right. 
uh, there's a character named Julian who becomes, he's, he's somebody Brendan the son knew in high school and he becomes an important person in uh, Mrs. Fletcher's life once her son leaves for college. And when you watch the show, he's, he's there from the very beginning. Um, but in the book, he appears several chapters in. Yeah. Um, and that was, the character didn't exist until that moment where I was just thinking like, there's got to be some connection between the two of them because he'd gone off to college and she was home and it, it didn't feel right that their stories were separate. And I, I wanted there to be some connecting piece. And so, you know, where Julian pops up in the book is really where he popped up. Yeah, it's, like, it's almost mind. like you leave them where you found them, right? It's like you, you don't move him back or anything. Yeah, whereas in the show when I had a chance to kind of have a different sense of the wholeness of the story, right. it seemed right that he was there at the beginning. But, but the book is, in a sense, a record of the writing of the book. Is there any time where you know the story before you tell the story, or is it always written like you don't have the whole thing in your head? I really try not to know. Yeah, okay. um, so if there's like a central question, um, so little children, Sarah meets uh, Todd, and the, the book is really the story of their affair, and the question is, are they gonna run off together? Mm -hmm. And I really try to keep myself in, in suspense, and so if there's something, some piece of evidence that makes me think they're gonna run off together, I'll try and create some obstacle that makes me think they're not. And I'll, it, you know, I'll keep trying to suspend my own knowledge of, right. of the ending. I think that's, because um, it's, it, it's hard not to stack the deck if you know. So I guess, I guess my question is, is everything your first draft or is it just, is there prose that comes in a second draft? Is it that sort of, if there's not story editing, is there? Well, it, so that, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, the thing is, something like the first chapter, I might have written, you know, 15 drafts of the first chapter. On the, like, in succession. But, but as, a, as a chapter. Part. Yeah. Um, like this week is about the first chapter or yeah. something, yeah. And so, so it's, it's hard for me to say, you know, when I hand in a first draft, that, that is the first draft uh, version of chapter one, but it's been through 15 drafts. Right. It's, um, it's the 15th of this and the 23rd of this. Yeah, uh, and that's because I think there's just all this time that needs to be put in at the top of a story, yeah. which is me learning the contours of the story and, and living with it. And so, you know, the first chapter of a book might take, you know, three or four months to write. Right. And, and the last chapter might take two weeks because I'm so deep into the story at that point, there's none of the self-doubt, there's none of the, you know, uh, stopping and starting over and scrapping it and, you know. Right. It, it, it's just clearer then and the choices are fewer. Right. So then I guess this is a good segue to get into adaptation because I feel like if, if you've already written the story and you know where the story is going, then thinking about how to adapt it is a whole different beast to you. Yeah, it's, a, it's an entirely different writing process. Then it, it, um, it does feel more like questions of craft. Right. Um, because some of the, the, a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. Though I will say um, the, the Leftovers was very different because uh, seasons two and three we had moved beyond the book. Right. And so it really did feel like we were writing um, I mean, we didn't have to create the characters because a lot of the characters existed, but the story was being built from scratch right. in, in those cases. But, um, but so um, we'll, we'll talk extensively about television, but let's start with film for a second. And just in that film adaptation process, do you still enjoy it? Or is it, or is it kind of the, the handy work, the tedious work of, of, of going from going from something that you already know the beast to just the craft piece of it? Um, you know, the, the craft piece of it is always engrossing yeah. to me. Um, and, you know, it often has taken place in a collaborative process, which is its own um, set of problems and, and opportunities. And so 
in some ways that takes the place of um, the challenge, the, the solitary challenges of writing a novel. Right. Um, the, often the writing of a script for me is the story of a collaboration with a particular person or mm -hmm. set of people, and, and that really becomes the nut that has to get cracked in a way. Like, you know, it, it's, it's about developing really like a, a relationship that involves trust and, and um, conflict and yeah. so, so it's, it's very engrossing but in a, in a much more um, interpersonal way. It's interesting because I, you know, in reading a lot of things you said and watching interviews and stuff, you've been very candid about, you know, some like your path through the business and things that worked in adaptation and things that didn't. And I'm curious how you feel about being in a collaborative environment, having chosen to be literary at first, having chosen to write novels, how, like, do you enjoy being in a collaborative environment? Is it is it difficult for you? What are the challenges? What's rewarding about it? Yeah, like it depends on the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, really, I, no, no, it's yeah. like because when when you have a bad day uh, as a novelist, it's it's mm -hmm. you just had a bad day, um, and you can hate yourself. But if I don't. I'm pretty good about not hating myself. Right. Um, uh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, you know, some writers aren't so good yeah, at that. Makes sense. Um, you know, I'll just go off and, you know, go for a bike ride or do something that clears my head. But um, if you're, like, in a psychic battle with a collaborator, and I, and I, don't, uh, I don't use that word lightly, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes you are, and um, that can become, like, that can, can really get in your head. You know, um, so, you know, I've definitely gone through that. And there's no way, I think, to avoid it. Like, anybody who's done collaborative storytelling knows that, you know, or songwriting or whatever it might be, right. you get to that place where you disagree about something that really means a lot to you. Um, that takes some real diplomatic skill, I think, to to get through that. And I think like particularly The Leftovers was, was such a story of, um, you know, Damien and I were coming from such different places. And, um, you know, it, season one we just routinely, you know, um, you know, banged our heads. And, and you know, I would, I, you know, I joked, but it wasn't a joke. Like I'd go to bed thinking about him and I'd wake up thinking about him. Um, I mean, and he probably would say the same thing. And, and um, by the end of it, we knew each other really. We would almost swapped roles. Like we, uh, he knew so completely, like what I would think. Like, right. he, you know, he would say something like, "What about this?" And I wouldn't say a word, and he'd just look at me and go, "What?" You know, right? Because um, he knew somehow just just from the look <laughs> on my face or the way I was sitting that I had some doubts, but. But also, he had internalized my voice, and I had internalized yeah. his, you know, and, and I think that was, um, you know, it was, it was a, a really interesting process. I'd never had that happen before. Was there something, I don't want to dig too deep in it, but was there a rewarding piece of it, too? Was there something rewarding about knowing each other that well? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, no, by and the, coming from different perspectives and being able to add to the piece in that way? Oh, yeah, no, by the end, I think there was just a huge amount of affection and respect in the sense that we had gone through something because it hadn't been right. it hadn't always been easy but I think we both felt like you know we had I, I, I know I know we'd learned from each other for sure um, and you know in some ways elevated each other um, so you know the, and again this, this is probably me wanting to talk about you know some redemptive story. Like, there was a lot no, of pain I, I in that curious, collaboration. Is there a happy ending to this? Yeah, and there really was. Yeah, I look back on it now with a huge amount of pride and affection. Yeah. Uh, but also, because I had to, I, you know, I, you know, there were times when I just thought, I can't, I can't do this. It's too hard to, you know, feel like my story is, is you know, turning into his story. Right, right. Um, and, and I think to collaborate, you do have to at some point say, this is our story, right. and, and it's hard to do. Um, I'm curious also if you feel like, to a certain extent, the tension creates great art. You know, you hear people say that sometimes, that 
the greatest art comes out of the tension. But I wonder if you think, you know, not to pit anybody against Damien, but but to say, you know, is it does it end up being a more rewarding process when you both battle on both sides and then come up with a collective story, or when it's like more simpatico? Is it is it? You know? Yeah, well, I, I would I, I wouldn't say it's like the harder it is, the better it is, yeah. but more more that um, the level of difficulty has nothing to do with the level of quality. Yeah. Like sometimes you have to really fight to tell the story and sometimes it's a really fun, frictionless thing. Right. But in, in the end you have to accept that whatever that process is, you have to go through it. I suppose it's a little bit like you rewriting those chapters. Sometimes it comes out very easy and it's less battling with yourself. And sometimes it comes out 15, 25 times later. Yeah, no, and it's right, you have to go through the process, right. whatever it is. Everybody wants their life to be fun and fr frictionless, but right. any writer knows that that's the rare, that's the rare case. Right. There's also a thing about the difference between film and television um, in which, you know, you talk about kind of the end point or leaving things along the way or that sort of thing, um, where television can always be, you're always leaving things along the way because you don't know where the end point is or what the end point is, or you know, you can introduce a character and not know when they're gonna come back or how much they're kind of gonna come back. Um, do you enjoy writing that more to a certain extent for that reason? Because it seems a little bit more in line with the way you write, you know? Uh, yeah, it, you know, I think, you know, my experience of writing television, both in The Leftovers and in Mrs. Fletcher is, um, there are often parts of the story that um, you're just waiting for them to reveal themselves. But in the meantime, you have to kind of move right. forward. And, and you know, with, um, I don't want to spoil anything on Mrs. Fletcher, which nobody here has seen yet, but um, I know there was a, just a huge element in our final episode that we, we just didn't know, you right. know, until the very, the very last minute. And, that is a terrible feeling, actually. You know, it's like there's a hole in your story mm -hmm. and you have to fill it. And, you know, the clock is ticking. <laughs> there's, it, it's very, that's, that's the most stressful part of, of television for me is the clock is ticking. Right. Um, especially when you're in production. Because in, um, in the literary world, there's less clock to it. You know, in the, you know, in the novel, I can just, you know, sleep on it. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. Yeah, um, which I like to do. <laughs> do you think you would ever do television that isn't, that is original? Do you think you would say, I'm just writing this for television? The, the few times I tried to write original scripts, yeah. um, I struggled with it because I, I, you know, to me the novel is this, just this period where I'm marinating in, in the story and getting to know the characters yeah. in a really intimate way. And I don't know, like, I haven't developed a process in screenwriting that would allow me to do that. In fact, I'm very much in awe of um, writers who can do it. Maybe they talk it through for a long time. I, I'd be very curious, actually, to hear in a talk like this, the Coen brothers talk about, right. you know, where their characters come from or something and how they get to that. Um, because for me, it's just literally like I live with the story for two years. I get to know the characters. And so by the time I am writing a script, I'm very familiar with them. Right. But script writing can go by very quickly. And so it can be hard, I think, to really fully envision the characters. Because you're not describing them. You're not yeah. doing all of the other like work physically. You're not creating the world, yeah. I think, in, in such detail yeah. where they have to live and, and gain substance. Yeah. Are there, you know, you talk about other people you admire that can do that. Are there specific, you know, showrunners, writers for television that you admire that you would? Oh, yeah, there, there's so many. I mean, um, I, I, I keep wanting to tell this story. Um, We're here? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I keep wanting to tell it accurately, but I can never remember what I was watching. I'm, I, my wife is here, and I, th I just remember one night just turning to her, like, and I can't remember if we were watching Mad Men or The Sopranos, where I just said, I want to do this, you know, I want to, I want to, 
have a TV show because <laughs> I just was so excited by what I had just seen and it, the writing just seemed so extraordinary. Um, and you know, those are, those are two shows that you know, just loom incredibly large in my, yeah. um, you know, my pantheon. But um, both, you know, both Matthew Weiner fingerprints. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, you know, my, my son and I have been watching Better Call Saul and we're big, you know, Breaking Bad fans right. and, and the level of writing on those shows is, um, you know, amazing to me. It's interesting you say that because also the interesting thing about Saul is it's a show with, which is a lot less dialogue. And I can only imagine the scripted piece of that is description. Mm -hmm. It's written more like a novel in a way. Yeah, no, the cold opens are yeah. incredibly, you know, Incredibly great on that show. Um, let's, uh, before I go to the audience for questions, let's talk a little bit about Mrs. Fletcher. Can you um, just give us a quick rundown on it and, and uh, the synopsis, but also as, as a television show versus as the novel? Yeah, so Mrs. Fletcher is a show about um, an empty nest mom and her son who's just started college. And it really is a, a two-hander in this sense. Um, in the pilot, she drops her son off at college and she goes home and she's divorced and she's um, really kind of, you know, being a mom has been the whole of her identity for the past decade. And she's looking at this moment and sensing a kind of looming emptiness and just thinking like, how do I start something new? And um, weirdly, the catalyst for what is new in her life is that um, she starts looking at porn and finds it to be um, somehow both inspiring and, and generative of possible identities. Mm -hmm. And as she does this, she starts experimenting and, and finding, um, you know, following her desires rather than, um, you know, hiding from them and um, it's sort of a you know we've been calling it like a midlife coming of age story mm -hmm. meanwhile her son who's very popular and sexually entitled goes to college at the height of this me too era and finds that you know he's experiencing real pushback against his sexual entitlement and so it kind of is a you know microcosm of um, you know all of, of our sexual culture, which is in one sense saying, you know, you need to go out there and, mm -hmm. and follow your desires and get what you want. And also, you know, maybe men need to curtail their desires. Maybe they need to um, control themselves. And it's, it's really about like these different models of sexuality that, that we're um, all navigating right now. It's, uh, before we take a look at the trailer from Mrs. Fletcher, I was curious, since it's such a theme on the show, um, you know, can you, do you mind talking a little bit about the role of sex in your work? Uh, especially because, you know, there's pieces where it, it's a symbol of evil, pedophilia in places, it's a symbol of a lot of things in Abstinence Teacher and a lot of things in this show. And so I, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about how you use sex throughout your work. Yeah, well, I think um, that at least since Little Children, which to me was a book about um, sexual transgression. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting is, you know, on the one hand, the sexual, you know, the sexual revolution has happened. And it's a, it's a book about adulterous lovers, but in a sense, you're kind of rooting for the adulterous lovers, which right. is, um, and they're not really seeming somehow like outside of the community. The way that in a 19th century novel, you know, Madame Bovary or, or um, you know, The Scarlet Letter, like the adulterous woman is the scary figure who threatens the whole social structure. Mm -hmm. um, in Little Children, you're kind of rooting for the adulterous woman, but it, there's also then this, um, sex offender pedophile who is in this town and now he's playing that role of, um, you know, for very good reason, the, the, the scary uh, potential predator, you know, but, but this is a sense of, 
you know, where we draw the line in terms of sexual transgression and the fact that it, it has moved so much over the years was, was part of what was interesting me there. Um, but I think, I think uh, looking at it now, like if I look at Little Children, the abstinence teacher, and Mrs. Fletcher together, I think um, they're all books that are exploring feminism and the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes those, these are the two big cultural revolutions of, I feel like, of, of my lifetime. And sometimes they f feel like they're in some sense working together and other times they, especially now, like, mm -hmm. like since the Me Too moment, they really feel like they're pitted against each other. And um, I think that's why I've started to explore female characters much more too. And because um, I, I feel like, you know, women's lives have just changed so much over the course of, of my adult life. And, and it, you know, feminism and the sexual revolution are the, the two engines of those changes and, and they've created, you know, lots of naughty situations. Right. Well, let's take a look at the clip from Mrs. Fletcher and then we'll take some audience questions. I don't think yeah. my parents really upset when I went away for college. Real quick, when does it air? It premieres uh, here October. tonight, and then... Oh yeah, we're gonna screen the first three episodes tonight. Yeah. Um, and in the US, it's uh, October 27th. Is that the same uh, I, I, I wouldn't know about HBO Canada. I'd have to ask them. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. Let's open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a microphone right here. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, so you, you started talking about it at the end, but I'm curious to know how um, you write about, or sorry, how you kind of develop your like uh, female characters within your shows. Um, you talked about how like you said it was interesting to like um, how their lives are changing and I was just wondering how, like how you develop them as it's like not to be like, you know, but it's a perspective that you, so I'm just curious about how you write about characters that you might not have like a direct perspective or like life experience. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. And um, when, when I um, started as a novelist, my, my first book was um, a bunch of coming of age stories really about male friendship. And then my second book was a novel about um, these guys who played together in, in a wedding band. And I, I was often grouped with um, Nick Hornby under this rubric of lad lit. Like I was a guy who wrote about guys. And, and, um, and I started, and I could feel like I, I wanted to tell bigger stories and I wanted, um, you know, to just investigate, you know, bigger questions than that. And, it really started when I wrote the book Election because um, Election is told from um, seven different um, first person narrators and, and they all have to feel, I think, you have to trust all of them to some degree, um, even though their stories don't always match up. And it was the first time I had to try and write first person from a female point of view. and, and um, and it was really scary, and it was just the beginning. This was in the early 90s, and so the, it was just the first kind of um, flowering of, of identity politics. It's, now it's like we're all very clear about what that is, but at that time it felt, it felt new, and there was suddenly this question, which had never been a question in the history of the novel, right? It's like Tolstoy writes Anna Karenina, and Flaubert writes Madame Bovary, and, um, you know, there was no sense that a male novelist 
might be wary of writing a female character or a female novelist might be wary of writing a male character. But suddenly that became like a morally fraught um, question. And, and I just thought, oh, but I, I have to, if, I can't tell this story unless I can um, make the, the female narrators as, as real as the male narrators. And, and the thing that, that made it work for me was that I, I, I did really kind of go into a autobiographical mode in that case, whereas like the character Tammy, who's the one who says like, who cares about this stupid election? Mm -hmm. She just wants to burn it down. Like, I, you know, I really gave her like my teen wise ass <laughs> um, personality. Yeah. And Tracy, you know, I, I was ambitious even, you know, back then I tried to hide it because it was, the culture wasn't as friendly to ambition yeah. at that time, but I was ambitious and I, I knew what that felt like. And I, I just, I, I think it's something that actors do too. You just find some way in on the character that you're, that you're playing. And if I could use that as a kind of true north and the characters would, would feel real to me. Cause I mean, you know, every creation of a fictional character is like, an experiment in empathy. Mm -hmm. And that experiment can go wrong. Like I'm fully aware of it and I know just how wary, um, you know, and, and careful. But you know, it's like you want to say that you have to be really careful when you do that, but as a writer, you don't want to be careful. You know, as a writer, you want to be bold. Right. And, and so you risk, I think, you know, the, the further you reach, the more, you know, you risk that kind of big, um, Big stumble. By the time I got to Mrs. Fletcher, I had written a series of novels with um, women characters in them, and and I had been, you know, very um, reassured because I, I often I developed a real female readership that hadn't been there before, and they would say to me like, "Oh, I, you know, either like I knew somebody just like that, or I'm just like that," you know, and so I had this feeling like, "Okay," I just started to trust that I could perform this act, you know, um, but, uh, but it's, it's somehow I feel like I have to be really, find some way into a particular character. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's what fiction writers do. It's just, it's hard to, to do and, and I'm more careful at the beginning when it's a, a, a woman character. Right. But eventually I want not to feel that, that I have to be careful. I'm, I'm not, like, like just for instance in Mrs. Fletcher, the chapters are divided between Mrs. Fletcher and her son and she's written in third person. So there's a certain narrative distance on her, mm -hmm. whereas the son is just this sort of in your face, first person, mm -hmm. teenage asshole narrator. <laughs> Over here. Hey, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you said that when you uh, start writing the story, you don't necessarily know where it will end. Uh, but what about your characters? When you start writing the story, how much have you already developed uh, in your head of what your characters will be like and how much you discover through the process? Um, I, I might know um, facts of, of their life. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know much more than that, really. Um, so almost everything is discovered through the writing. Um, I, think, I think my characters have a certain, um, like, like, you can recognize them as my characters. Like, they're mostly people who seem, um, they're not, like, out there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of, if it's fair to say some person feels like an ordinary person. Mm -hmm. Like I try to keep them closer to the middle of the spectrum. You know, they're, yeah. they're not... Um, it's some piece of that suburbia. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's not, it's, they're not eccentric somehow. That, that, those are the characters I feel comfortable. Some of the supporting characters can be eccentric or, or bold, but the, the main characters um, feel like ordinary or typical. Like, and and I, I do play with types. like. Like a lot of my characters might appear to be types, 
at the beginning. And, and that's why I think my work sometimes seems to be satire. Like mm -hmm. Brendan might seem like a stereotypical male asshole. Right. Um, but then my job is to like deepen him and maybe because he comes out at you as a sort, of, a sort of type and you feel like I know him and I know how I feel about him, that if he starts to surprise you and, and deepen, then I think there's some surprise to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, those, are, those are two ways I approach character, I think. Yeah. Anybody else? Bill. Sorry. Hello. Um, I kind of have a more mechanical question. Uh, you talked about, uh, I mean, clearly you adapt a lot of your own work into script format. Um, how do you work on the, pro is, do you have a process for that in terms of distillation of obviously a novel that can be as long as you want and the scripts generally have to be a bit more tighter. How do, how do you work that process of distilling it? Yeah, well, you know, that. Um, Thank you. I th actually think that's one of the reasons I've been increasingly drawn to TV. Um, because TV shows are kind of expandable, in a sense. Um, when, when Todd Field and I adapted my novel, Little Children, um, you know, we sat down together, and there was literally that moment of like, okay, where do we start? And Todd said, let's start at the beginning. And, and we, you know, we, we did start at the beginning, and, and we wrote an incredibly long script. You know, our final script was... Um, you know, I think 150 pages or something. And, and what that meant was that um, we had to cut a lot of scenes. We should actually shot that whole long script, but we had to cut big. Was it a straight adaptation of the book? Was it like literally scene for scene in the book? There, there were a couple new scenes added, but, um, but it was pretty straightforward adaptation, which was, um, it worked surprisingly well mm -hmm. um, to, to do it that way. Um, but, but we ended up having to, to cut. And, and that was, I think, you know, we had talked about the possibility of a long form adaptation of that. And there were just fewer opportunities in 2007 to make mm -hmm. that happen. Um, but after it was done, I thought, uh, you know, Little Children wasn't a long novel, but it clearly burst the bounds of a feature script. and. You know, The Leftovers was bigger than that, I thought, in, in many ways. And I just thought, it's got to be um, TV. Yeah. Because it just, it, it's an idea that, the idea is so big that, that the book didn't exhaust it. You right. know, and and the, I don't think the show even exhausted it in a way. But, um, so that, that, that's, it is a, a challenge to figure out how to take a novel that, fills whatever space it needs to fill and adapt it into, um, you know, film narrative, which usually has m much clearer parameters. Mm -hmm. Right here. Um, if you've got, this is building on that question, if you've got something like seven different first person POVs or um, something structurally innovative, or third person and then first. Do you think about that when you're adapting it to screen at all? If, about maintaining any of the stylistic specificity of the novel? Yeah, well, I mean, um, one of the, uh, you know, things I, I love about Alexander Payne's uh, adaptation of Election was that that, you know, I gave him this novel that had seven first-person narrators, and you know there was an adult, the teacher, and then there were all these um, young narrators, and and everybody involved, you know, producers and executives, all just assumed like, okay, you've got to choose. Um, is it the teacher's story? Is it the student's story? If it is, you know, which one is the main character? And Alexander just said they all are. And he wrote that script, which I think, you know, that movie, one of the reasons I think it's still um, talked about is that it, it just doesn't feel like, there just aren't a lot of movies that have that many different voiceover narrators. And they create their own separate realities and, and the story is, um, you know, really kaleidoscopic in that sense. So he really broke that rule which said a film needs to have a central character that the audience identifies with. Um, 
he, he broke it up and, and really kept that, that structure of the book. Um, and, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that that, that could be done. Um, I think at that time, you know, like I was always so depressed when I would um, read those how to write a screenplay book and, and it would just say like, here's how, here's the, it's not just here's like one way, it's like here's the way. And you know, this happens on this page and this happens on that page and every story is the same story. Like um, that's, that was, to a novelist that just feels so limited because you, you do have a multitude of ways to, to tell a story as, as a novelist. So, um, but like, like interestingly with little children, um, and this was really, I think, Todd's innovation, and it was very flattering to me. He's like, the voice of the novel is so strong, like we need to put that into the, the film. So if you see that movie, there's that, um, it's just a, a sort of authoritative male voice that kind of narrates uh, the story. But the strange, and, and some of it is just lines taken right from the novel, but they weren't from that character's voice. They were third person from the character's minds. And, and so even though that felt like a, a way to be faithful to the book, it was actually a device that really changed, it really changed the story. Um, so, but but I, I like that kind of thing. I do feel like um, introducing a new element can also be really um, destabilizing in a good way and help, help the story just come alive in a cinematic sense. We have time for one more. I'm going to go here. Yep. Hi, my name is Terry Hawks. I'm a writer. Um, thanks very much for your characters. I'm embarrassed to admit that uh, 20 years ago or so, I was accused by someone close to me of being a little bit like Tracy Flick. And today, having just delivered my twins to university, I feel a little bit more like Eve Fletcher, minus the porn, but I might have to rethink that. Um, <laughs> and my question is about the, um, the, the, the writer's room for Mrs. Fletcher. I'm really looking forward to seeing the show. I'm curious about the writer's room. Do you share responsibilities with other producers is it your baby? Do you write all the scripts yourself? And then, assuming that this is as successful as it sounds like it might be, do you think you, you would consider taking spec scripts in the future? Thanks. <laughs> um, so we had a writer's room uh, for Mrs. Fletcher, and uh, the scripts were written by a variety of writers. And um, it was uh, like like, all the writers rooms I've been in, a, a, a very lively and contentious, uh, argumentative place. And, and I, you know, I, I took that as a, a good sign. You know, I think everybody felt really connected to the, um, the subjects that we, that we were dealing with. It's like, it's a funny show to some degree, but, um, you know, it's also about, um, some of the darker aspects of our contemporary sexual culture and, and uh, you know, it was, it was weird, it was also a very funny room. I, I think uh, we just had some very funny people in it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, that becomes a story, it's like how does this group of people reach a consensus. And, and sometimes, you know, that, that means that um, the person who's in charge of the room has to just say, it's gonna be, it's gonna be this. But um, you wanna, I think, save that moment for as late as possible. You really want there to be a kind of group effort to come to some mm -hmm. new place. You know, that's, that's, what's, that's what's great in a writer's room. You know, when there are those days when you just sit there and, and feel stymied, and then there's an idea that un unlocks that impasse. And, and everybody knows it when it happens, you know? It's, it's, uh, and it's that strange thing where it's a thing that happens when you write alone all the time, and there's some satisfaction. But it's very interesting to watch a group just accept, like, the inevitability of, like, yes, that, that is it. 
That's, that's the idea. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, and that, that is a real... And that's when some, you know, you really do feel like you're part of a team somehow, that, that you know, together we got through that. Um, that. That is a very satisfying... It's the ultimate product of collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming and doing this with us. I'm afraid we're out of time, but oh, thank well, you so much. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for all these great questions. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.